Making the headlines tonight. Prime Minister Hun Sen has stated that he will use the money made from the sale of the Chinese language translation of his own book, Unbreakable Love, to build a house for veterans. The National Assembly's fifth expert committee has dismissed allegations made by the chairperson of ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights regarding Prime Minister Hun Sen's visit to Myanmar. The head of the WHO has said it would be dangerous to assume that the world was in the end game of the pandemic. Colombian cyclist Egan Bernal suffered a crash on Monday and was confirmed to have been taken to the hospital for surgery. And two of the world's most famous paintings by Leonardo da Vinci have been brought to life using cutting-edge technology in Berlin. This is the Daily Roundup on EAC News Channel. A very good evening to you. I'm Darshana Gauchin. Prime Minister Hun Sen had a virtual meeting with Myanmar military leader Min Aung Hlaing on Wednesday afternoon to discuss the situation in Myanmar since his official state visit to the country earlier this month. During the meeting, Prime Minister Hun Sen reminded the military leader to remain patient and honor his commitment to implement the five-point consensus of ASEAN. He further stated that it is necessary for Myanmar to facilitate the ASEAN Special Envoy of the Chair to visit Myanmar for the first time, to be very patient in maintaining the ceasefire, and to join ASEAN in ensuring the provision of citizens' assistance in Myanmar. The minister delegate attached to the Prime Minister, Kao Kim Hoon, stressed to reporters after the meeting between the Prime Minister and General Min On Hlaing that the Prime Minister specifically requested this call to make sure the Myanmar military leader pays attention to the appeal on this point. The meeting between Prime Minister Hun Sen and Min On Hlaing this afternoon followed renewed violence between the military and armed rebel forces in Myanmar's Rakhine state, which has forced tens of thousands of people to flee their homes. So far, two ASEAN countries, Indonesia and Malaysia, have expressed their desire to maintain their representation of Myanmar if there is no crisis with the ASEAN five-point consensus for Myanmar. This means that Myanmar's spot in the ASEAN summit will be left open or will have non-political representatives in attendance. ASEAN's five-point consensus for Myanmar calls for an end to the violence, the establishment of multilateral dialogue, and the agreement to the coordination of ASEAN special envoys to visit the country and provide humanitarian assistance. Prime Minister Hun Sen has expressed surprise that his own book titled Unbreakable Love, which was translated into Chinese by the Cambodian Chinese Association, had sold out in a short period of time. EAC News reporter Srai Borkong has more details. Prime Minister Hun Sen wrote on his Facebook page on Wednesday that 1,500 copies of his book in Chinese were sold in a short period of time, earning a total of $7,500, which he said would be used to build homes for veterans to live in. The veterans are the ones that the Prime Minister care about the most. He considered veterans to be the ones who have the greatest merit for the people of the motherland of Cambodia and who have contributed to building peace and social stability to this day. On the occasion of receiving the Peace Gold Medal from the Universal Peace Federation on 12 September 2021, Prime Minister Hun Sen had announced he would be donated the $1 million he received in prize money to build a house for veterans. Currently, more than 100,000 veterans receive monthly social security from the state. Since April 2020, the royal government has increased the monthly social security allowance for veterans to 640,000 reals per month, including the monthly family allowance and 50,000 reals for the command new year. Sri Kong, EAC News. The Minister of Foreign Affairs and Cooperation of the Democratic Republic of Timor-Leste will pay an official visit to the Kingdom of Cambodia at the invitation of the Cambodian Foreign Minister, Praxokon, on 26 to 29 January 2022. This announcement was made in a press release issued by the Cambodian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation on Tuesday. EAC News reporter Chamrong Ritisit has more. The statement included that during Minister Aldaljizar Abatina Xavier Resmagno state visit, she will be paying a courtesy call to Prime Minister Hun Sen and will also hold a bilateral meeting with Minister Prasokon to discuss various aspects of bilateral relations and cooperation as well as regional 
an international issue of common interest and concern. This includes Timor-Leste, application for ASEAN membership. Minister Adaljiza Magno is also expected to have separate meetings with other Cambodian dignitaries from both the public and private sectors. The statement concluded that the official visits of Minister Adaljiza Magno will reaffirm Timor-Leste's commitment to working more closely with Cambodia to further strengthen relations and cooperation both bilateral and multilateral frameworks for the mutual benefit for both countries. Jombarong Ratisat, EAC News. The National Assembly's Fifth Expert Committee, the Commission on the Foreign Affairs, International Cooperation, Information and Media, has dismissed the allegations made by the Chairperson of ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights, Charles Santiago, during Prime Minister Hun Sen's visit to Myanmar. Charles Santiago told Malaysian media yesterday that Prime Minister Hun Sen was using cowboy diplomacy in Myanmar and was undermining the evolution of the ASEAN consensus for Myanmar. In a statement issued on 24th January, the Fifth Expert Committee of the National Assembly of Cambodia described Charles Santiago's remarks as blaseless and blind, as well as anti-peace and uncivilized. The Fifth Expert Committee, chaired by Su Yara, has suggested that Charles Santiago should re-educate himself and have enough decency to accept the facts as well as the outcomes of Prime Minister's visit to Myanmar. The statement outlined the results of the Prime Minister's visit, such as the extension of the ceasefire until the end of 2022, opening the door to humanitarian aid, pledging support for the coordination and facilitation of the ASEAN Special Envoy to meet with all parties concerned in the peace process, which supports ASEAN's five-point consensus on Myanmar, and which acts as the foundation of peace and reconciliation in the country. The statement added that Charles Santiago and his allies should accept the fact that Prime Minister Hun Sen's visit shows his personal devotion to peacebuilding for Myanmar, as well as the welfare and human rights of the people of Myanmar, while putting himself and his delegation at risk both during the COVID-19 pandemic and in the ongoing crisis in Myanmar. The Funsenpec political party has decided to postpone its Congress to early February, as the party states that the current acting chairman and party members are currently busy with other activities at the grassroots level. EAC News reporter Chamrong Ritisit has more. The Funsenpec party has previously planned in December to hold a Congress at the end of January to elect a new party chairman. Funsenpec spokesman Nun Radain has told EAC News that the delay has caused no problem since it has 90 days to elect a new president. He also confirmed that the party has agreed to organize the leadership in accordance with the status already in place, and party members are just waiting for the days of the Congress. He continued that the Congress is now scheduled to be held in early February. We are in addition to deciding on the elections of Prindu Rodam Jakrawut as party president. The Congress we are also set the goal to organize the Commune District's Council elections and the 2022 national elections, as well as setting policies for the competitions. Former Funsin President Nurodam Ranarat died at the age of 77 in France on 28 November 2021. After his death, Funsin officially announced its preparation for a new Congress amid controversy between dissidents and supporters. On 20 January, the ministers of interior saw King Aprin Nurodam Chakrawut to mediate within the party before holding a congress to select a new party leaders. Jumbarong Ratisat, EAC News. The Ministry of Environment, together with the Ministry of Mines and Energy, is considering energy development projects for older power plants to increase electricity as well as stop emissions from burning black oil. EAC News reporter Srai Porkong has more. Speaking at a press conference on the Cambodian Clean Air Plan on Tuesday, Under Secretary of State for the Ministry of Environment, Chiesina, said that the Ministry of Environment and the Ministry of Mine and Energy plan to repurpose small old power plants in Phnom Penh to modify and develop those factories to both improve power and reduce air pollution. He added that the collection of small power plants are under the project of the Ministry of Mine and Energy because of the low generation of energy from these plants and the impact these plants have on the population of people who live nearby. 
He said that the Ministry of Mine and Energy will take certain small power plants in Phnom Penh, such as those in Chaangre or in Tuasungkai, halt their operations and remove them because they release too many harmful emissions, and the goal is to form a clean Phnom Penh. The two ministries acknowledge that this power plant have disrupted the life of people living nearby when in operation, as they emit black smoke as well as flame by running on lake oil, unlike modern coal fire plants. According to people who live in Turoka village in Minchai district, the power plant in the area often produce sound and vibration to disturb residents, and the plant also emit a lot of smoke, which is very disrupting to residents. Under Secretary of State Chiusina said that this power plant has been operating since the community of the common people era and produces less than 10 megawatt of powers. He added that the factory operates by burning black oil, which causes smoke and debris to fall on nearby residents' home while in operation. He continued that they have two options for these old power plants, either to relocate all those plants from Vitit Phnom Penh or to stop all the operations immediately. Sri Pokong, EAC News. The Ministry of Public Works and Transport is collecting information and investigating the case of a train collision in Sienegville on Tuesday, which caused two drivers to be injured and sent to hospital. The spokesman for the Ministry of Public Works and Transport, Kung Vimien, told EAC News that the Royal Railway team and authorities in Sienegville were now inspecting and gathering information on the accident. He said that the train company had also sent officials to work with the local authorities during the evening and this morning, but he was unable to provide other details since they are still waiting for the team to finish the investigation. The trains collided near three villages in Commune 3, Sienegville, and caused some damage, including the overturn of many train containers. The two train drivers were injured and taken to hospital, and the full cost of the damage is not yet known. The Phnom Penh Capital Administration has issued a proclamation banning the use of fireworks and explosives of all kinds during the upcoming 2022 Lunar New Year to avoid affecting the health of the sick as well as affecting the security and social order of society. EAC News reporter Srai Kong has more. In the proclamation dated Tuesday, 25 January, the Phnom Penh Capital Administration ordered the confiscation and ban on the use of firework and all kinds of explosives from 31 January to 3rd February to avoid any incidents. The Phnom Penh Capital Administration also ordered the relevant authority to monitor, prevent, and remind people in Phnom Penh not to set fireworks or explosives of any kind during the festival. In addition to banning fireworks, the Phnom Penh Municipal Administration also prohibits all forms of gambling and other unauthorized religious or traditional matches. In particular, the burning of kerosene must be done in mental containers or ethern port. It is strictly forbidden to burn kerosene on the side road or on public roads. Entertainment venue across the city must adhere to health measures to prevent the spread of COVID-19, especially the Omicron variant, maintain security, safety, public order, dignity, and be careful in lighting candles, incense stick, and electric stove that could cause fire if left unattended. The Department of Call and Religion of Phnom Penh and the 14 district department and units around the capital administration shall disseminate the instruction to the China Vietnam Association, civil servants, subordinate, and local people to be aware of this instruction. Phnom Penh Capital Administration urge citizens to take action against those who violate this instruction or commit crime that cause social unrest disorder, affect security, safety, and public order, to punish them according to the law enforced. Sri Pokong, EAC News. The Cambodian Minister of Health, Mom Bun Heng, and the Deputy Director General of the National Administration of Traditional Chinese Medicine, Huang Lu Chi, have signed an agreement to send a team of traditional Chinese medicine experts to Cambodia to help strengthen COVID-19 prevention measures by integrating traditional Chinese medicine into treatment for the disease. EAC News reporter Chamrong Ritisit has more. The agreement was reached during a meeting on Tuesday, 25th January, between the Ministers of Health, Mom Bun Heng, the Deputy Directors of the National Administration of Traditional Chinese Medicines, 
and the president of the Chinese Academy of Chinese Medical Science, Huang Luqi, and the Chinese ambassadors to Cambodia, Wang Wenpin, with a delegation from the ministries of health in Phnom Penh. The meeting was organized to take place during Deputy Director Huang Luqi visit to Cambodia, where he also visited the Cambodia-China Friendship Hospitals in Prekosama, which is said to be inaugurated soon. Minister Mom Bunhain agreed on the initiative to send Chinese traditional medicines experts to help treat COVID in Cambodia, and thanks the Chinese delegation for his cooperation. He stressed that this effort to strengthen the capacities of Cambodian health officials will last not just four years, but at the new Cambodia China's Friendships Hospitals, but will also be expanded to another hospital as well. Jembrong Retiset, EAC News. Cambodia has reported 22 new COVID-19 cases, which includes five imported cases. There have been 20 patient recoveries and once again, no deaths. Cambodia recorded another rise in Omicron cases today. The kingdom recorded 17 new community and five new imported cases of the new variant. Cambodia has now recorded 675 cases of Omicron, 434 imported and 241 community cases. Cambodia's COVID-19 case tally has now climbed to 121,116. The death toll stands at 3,015. The number of patients treated successfully since the pandemic reached Cambodia is 117,267. And the tally for imported cases has climbed to 20,291. Healthcare workers are now treating a total of 801 patients. The head of the World Health Organization has said on Monday, January 24th, it would be dangerous to assume that the highly transmissible Omicron was the last variant to emerge and that the world was in the end game of the pandemic. The World Health Organization General Director Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus has said it's possible this year to exit the acute phase of the pandemic where COVID-19 constitutes a global health emergency if strategies and tools such as testing and vaccines are used in a comprehensive way. Speaking at the opening of executive board meeting, Tedros has mentioned since Omicron was first identified a little over nine weeks ago, more than 80 million cases had been reported to the United Nations Agency, more than were reported in the whole of 2020. Conditions are ideal for more variants to emerge, he added. There are different scenarios for how the pandemic could play out and how the acute phase could end. But it's dangerous to assume that Omicron will be the last variant or that we are in the end game. On the contrary, globally, the conditions are ideal for more variants to emerge. To change the course of the pandemic, we must change the conditions that are driving it. If countries use all of these strategies and tools in a comprehensive way, we can end the acute phase of the pandemic this year. We can end COVID-19 as a global health emergency and we can do it this year. What does that look like? It means achieving our target to vaccinate 70% of the population of every country with a focus on the most at-risk groups. In March and April 2021, Russia massed about 100,000 soldiers and military equipment near its border with Ukraine, representing the highest force mobilization since the country's annexation of Crimea in 2014. This precipitated an international crisis and generated concerns over a potential invasion. On Monday, the Kremlin has accused the United States and its allies of escalating east-west tensions by announcing plans to boost NATO forces in Eastern Europe and evacuate the families of diplomats from the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine. Currently, Russia and Ukraine are engaged in the Russo-Ukrainian War, which started in 2014 following the Russian annexation of Crimea from Ukraine and saw an escalation in early 2021. 
After the Soviet Union's dissolution in 1991, the successor states' bilateral relations have undergone periods of ties, tensions, and outright hostility. In the early 1990s, Ukraine's policy was dominated by aspirations to ensure its sovereignty and independence, followed by a foreign policy that balanced cooperation with the EU, Russia, and other powerful polities. Relations between the two countries have been hostile since the Revolution of Dignity, which toppled Ukraine's elected president, Viktor Yanukovych, and his supporters, because he refused to sign a political association and free trade agreement with the European Union that enjoyed majority support in Ukraine's parliament. Ukraine's post-revolutionary government wished to commit the country to a future within the EU and NATO, rather than continue to play the delicate diplomatic game of balancing its own economic and security interests with those of Russia, the EU, and NATO members. In 2004, the Czech Republic, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, and Slovakia had joined the EU, followed by Bulgaria and Romania in 2007. The Russian government feared that Ukraine's membership of the EU and NATO would complete a Western wall of allied countries by restricting Russia's access to the Black Sea. With South Korea and Japan being allied to the US, the Russian government was concerned that Russia was being ring-fenced by potentially hostile powers. In the wake of the Revolution of Dignity, Russia-backed separatist militias in the Donetsk People's Republic and the Luhansk People's Republic in a war in Ukraine's economically important Donbas region on its eastern border with Russia. This region has a Russian ethnic majority. By early 2020, the war in Donbas had killed more than 13,000 people and brought some Western sanctions on Russia. Throughout 2021, Russian military buildup on the border of Ukraine has escalated tensions between the two countries and strained bilateral relations, with the United States sending a strong message that invasion would be met with dire consequences for Russia's economy. These events continue in 2022. The Russian Foreign Ministry has announced several demands in December 2021, including a prohibition in Ukraine joining the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and a decrease of NATO soldiers and military equipment in Eastern Europe in exchange for the withdrawal of Russian armed forces. The United States and other NATO members have rejected these requests and have warned Russia of increased economic sanctions should it invade Ukraine. Bilateral U.S.-Russia diplomatic talks were held in January 2022, but did not defuse the crisis. The crisis has been described as one of the most intense since the Cold War. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov has admitted, the possibility of conflict is present and now it is very high. It's now higher than before. New York City Mayor Eric Adams on Monday, January 24th, has announced a plan to end gun violence in a city reeling from the fatal shooting of a police officer and a spate of violent crimes, as he promised to increase police officers in New York's most violence-plagued communities. Adams, a former police captain, has said the plan would deliver on his November election campaign, flexed by deploying more officers. Steaming the flows of guns into the cities and appointing anti-gun violence coordinators in every city agency. We are turning our pain into purpose, he said at a news conference following a city of highly public site lethal crime in the city since he has sworn in on January 1st. Today, we are releasing our blueprint to end gun violence. I want to be clear, this is not just a plan for the future. It is a plan for right now. Gun violence is a public health crisis. There's no time to wait. We must act. The sea of violence comes from many rivers. We must dam every river that feeds this greater crisis. Our blueprint to end gun violence addresses each one of these causes with both immediate interventions and long-term prevention strategies. It will involve the NYPD, every city agency, our courts, and the successful anti-violence crisis management system. We're going to involve every community, every precinct, and our state and federal partners. New Yorkers will see and feel these changes quickly. We will ramp up enforcement, deploy more officers on the streets and in the subways, and get our courts at full capacity. This is the gun that killed our young officer on Friday night, a 45 caliber modified gun. It is illegal to carry a gun in our city, 
Yet our police officers take them off the streets every day in record numbers. Since January 1st, when I took office, our officers have taken 350 illegal guns off the street. Last year, over 6,000 guns were confiscated. Our officers are doing heroic work getting guns off the streets, but traffickers keep the guns coming. That must end. We must stop the flow of illegal guns in our city. The iron pipeline must be broken. The NYPD is our first line of defense against gun violence. We will make new efforts to strengthen and reinforce it while continuing our mission to involve the community. We will start by putting more officers on patrol in key neighborhoods throughout the city. We will enhance existing public safety units with new neighborhood safety teams, which will focus on gun violence. We will launch these additional teams in the next three weeks with deep focus on 30 precincts where 80% of violence occurs, even as the public safety units continue their life-saving work. In doing this, we will avoid mistakes of the past. These officers will be identifiable as NYPD. They will have body cameras and they will have enhanced training and oversight. There are no gun manufacturers in New York City. Yet even as the NYPD removed 6,000 guns from our streets last year, we know that new guns are arriving by car, by bus, and by train every day. The NYPD will work with state law enforcement to implement spot checks at every entry point like Port Authority and other bus and train stations. We will also move forward on using the latest in technology to identify problems, follow up on leads, and collect evidence. From facial recognition technology to new tools that can spot those carrying weapons, we will use every available method to keep our people safe. Two police officers were shot in Harlem on Friday while responding to a domestic violent call, leaving one dead and the other in critical conditions. Two other officers were shot in a separate incident last week in other parts of the city. As in many U.S. cities, murders and gun violence have surged over the past two years in New York. Experts say the trend partly reflects the social disruption from the pandemics and its effects of reducing the numbers of police officers on duties. The city counted 488 murders last year, up 5.6% over 2020 following a 47% some years earlier. The biggest year-to-year -year percentage increase ever recorded in the country's most popular city. The spike ended a fairly steady decline in murders since 1990 when the numbers peaked at 2,245, shooting double from 2019 to 1,532 in 2020 and increased 2% 2 in 2021, according to city statistics. The blueprint to end gun violence will, within three weeks, put more police officers on patrol in 30s of city 70 Precede where 80% of city's violence occur, Adam said. The officer identifiables as New York Police Department employees will have body worn cameras and in hand trainings and oversight. Travelers into New York City will be screened for illegal guns with facial recognition technology at no spot checks at various entry points. City authorities confiscate illicit firearms on a regular basis, with 6,000 removed in 2021 but new guns enter the cities at a faster rate, according to Adams. Adam encouraged prosecutors to triage gun cases to ensure they are the first cases brought to court, and urged lawmakers to reduce the numbers of guns that a person must traffic before they can be charged with a felony. And now for a look at news making international headlines this Wednesday, 26 January. The roof of a cargo warehouse has collapsed at Istanbul Airport after heavy snowfall hit the city on Monday, January 24. 
A footage shows several people walking around rubble inside the damaged warehouse during the blizzard. It also shows people walking through heavy snow outside the airport and cars slowly driving on a nearby road blanketed in white. Turkish authorities have temporarily stopped all flights at Istanbul Airport on Monday, while winter weather has snarled transportation across the country. The heavy snowfall also put a stop to some of Istanbul's ferry services, shut some roads, and caused visibility problems for drivers. Nationwide, the Disaster and Emergency Authority has said some 4,600 people were stranded due to weather, and more than 6,700 were taken to shelters, while thousands of containers of food supplies were delivered to those in need. Many parts of Turkey have been hit with heavy snowfall since last week, which coincide with a winter break at most schools. Turkish flag carrier Turkish Airlines has said it had cancelled all flights from Istanbul Airport until Tuesday to ensure travel safety and for all their passengers and to prevent them from being stranded at airports. A medical group has announced three more people were killed in Sudan on Monday, 24 January, as thousands of people once again took to the streets of the capitals and other cities. After two protesters killed, one was shot in the chest and the others in the head, the group have said. And those are not protesters were injured in the capital, Khartoum, and the cities of Odoman. The Sudanese security forces fired live rounds and tear gas during protests Again, military rules that attract tens of thousands of people across the country, medics have said. Side protests, along with barricades throughout the capitals and the general strike last week, have continued since the military took powers on October 25, ending a partnership with civilian political parties since the removals of Omar al Bashir, a Sudan ruler in 2019. Some 76 civilians have been killed and more than 2,000 injured in crackdowns on the protests. According to the Central Committees of Sudanese Doctors, which is aligned with the protest movement, mainly by gunshots and tear gas canisters, police could not immediately be reached for comment. Protesters chanted and marched a security forces through tear gas. A protester who participated to several demonstrations and got injured has said that he won't stop matching. I was hit on the 6th of January in my feet, and was hit here showing his head in the head on 10th of January. Today is the 24th. I'm still matching. I will match tomorrow and the day after tomorrow until we die, he bravely said. Sudan military leaders have said the right to peaceful protest is protested. The Sovereign Council, Sudan military leaders have said the right to peaceful protest is protested. The Sovereign Council, Sudan higher authorities run by the military received a briefing on the works of the committees investigating protested death. It said in a statement, the violence has deepened the deadlock between pro-democracy group and the military leaderships. A witness recounts security forces using tear gas and stun grenades as protesters stood 1.2 kilometers from the presidential palace. In the cities of Bari, and on domains, other witnesses saw a heavy security presence and tear gas fire on the main road. The protests were called by neighborhood resistance committees, which advocate a stance of no legitimacy, no negotiation, no partnership toward the military. One committee has reported the arrest of at least four members, another said its headquarters were raided. There were also large protests in the cities of Madani. We have witnesses said protesters might toward the house of a protester kills on Friday before heading to the states of government building. Last week, the United States has condemned the use of force against protesters, saying it would consider additional measures. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization has said on Monday, January 24th, it was putting forces on standby and have reinforced Eastern Europe with more ships and fighter jets in what Russia denounced as Western hysteria in response to its buildup of troops on the Ukraine border. 
Denmark is sending four F-16 fighter jets and a frigate to NATO's operations in the Baltic region and Northern Europe. The frigate Peter Welmos has left port last week and will strengthen one of NATO's standing naval forces, Standing NATO Maritime Group 1, which usually operates in the Baltic Sea as well as the Northern and Eastern Atlantic. According to the Danish Armed Forces, the Peter Welmos will be part of the force until the end of April. After the break, a look at all the latest sports news. ហើយលោកអ្នកជិតរៀបអាពីពីពីមែនទេហើយពិបាករកក្រុមហ៊ុនថតវីដេអូផ្សាយផ្ទាល់ដែលមានគុណភាពមែនទេអស់កង្វល
The 25-year-old was taken to the hospital by Ineos Grenadiers medical staff and was conscious upon arrival. The British team said in a brief statement, Bernal recently extended his contract with Ineos Grenadiers to 2026. At least eight people died and 38 were injured in a stampede when fans stormed a stadium hosting an Africa Cup of Nations soccer match in Cameroon's capital on Monday, 24th January. A panicked crowd trying to squeeze through a narrow entran gate at the newly built Olembe Stadium in their own day that was hosting a round of 16 game between Cameroon and Comoros. The stampede came as a heavy blow for the tournaments which has grown in excitement on the pitch in recent day, thanks to some match upset but which was under scrutiny for a lack of readiness beforehand. COVID-19 and insecurity caused by separatist insurgency also complicated preparations. Works on the 60,000-seat Olembe Stadium has continued right up to the start of Africa's top soccer tournaments, prompting the Confederations of African Football, CAF. The continent soccer's governing body to hold an emergency meeting to discuss counseling and competition altogether. The Confederations of African Football, CAF, has said in a statement that it was investigating the tragic incident that took place at Olembe Stadium during the Total Energies Africa Cup of Nation fixtures between Haas, Cameroon, and Commerce on Monday, 24 January. CAF is currently investigating the situations and trying to get more detail on what transpired. We are in constant communication with Cameroon government and the local organizing committee, the statement also said. Following a low turnout in the first round games at brand new stadium built for the continent's premier men's soccer tournaments, Cameroon authorities have thrown open stadium gates, organized mass transport and giving out free tickets to lure fans. And now for a look at how the weather will be playing out tomorrow. And finally, two of the world's most famous paintings, the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper, both by the Italian painter Leonardo da Vinci, have been brought to life using high technology, the genius immersive experience, a creative journey through the eyes of the artist today. It will be exhibited at an art show to premiere on January 28th in Berlin, Germany. The show, Genius Immersive Experience, is set to premiere on January 28th in Berlin, Germany. The artworks to be presented at the Berlin show are The Mona Lisa and The Last Supper, two iconic paintings by Italian artist and polymath Leonardo da Vinci. The one-hour art show lets you interact with The Mona Lisa and The Last Supper and delves into the mind of its artist. The Genius Immersive Experience allows for a creative journey through the eyes of Leonardo da Vinci today. It is a completely new immersive and interactive art experience that leads the way for the next generation of shows. It acts as a revision of Leonardo's work and is next generation, touchable and playable, a form of edutainment and a music experience all combined. The show is ahead of its time just as Leonardo da Vinci was during his era. The show will allow people to experience what it is like inside one of the brightest minds that ever existed. Spectators can interact and feel the power of human creativity, the light bulb moment of invention, and the inner workings of a genius like da Vinci. People can also explore his inventions and ideas with the help of state-of-the-art technology. 
Leonardo da Vinci explored the world around him through science, art, and intuition. He realized that humankind was created not just to mark time, but also to invent, create, and aspire to achieve knowledge. The artist was fascinated with the stars and with the zodiac. This was his inspiration behind the masterpiece The Last Supper, in which 12 apostles represent the 12 signs of the zodiac. Leonardo da Vinci famously said, There are three classes of people, those who see, those who see when they are shown, those who do not see. Another famous quote of the artist is, all our knowledge has its origins in our perceptions. We can take you on a journey through da Vinci's genius mind and think about what would he think, you know, let's say da Vinci wakes up today, 500 plus years after, and he's like, what would he think about the technical revolution, you know? How would he paint his paintings? What kind of technology would he use? What we do is architecture, and we have been finding a way to bring everything together that we have been doing in the last years in one project. So it involves space. It's immersive. It's interactive. We're using a lot of digital technology. It's a very technical show. It's musical. The soundtrack is very important and it's all about combining all of these elements. It's very multi-sensory and I find that fascinating. The genius immersive experience presents what the vision of Leonardo might have been today, adding that the revision of his work presents how he would have perceived our attitudes towards ecology, nature, science, space exploration and modern art. Thank you for watching the Daily Roundup on EAC News Channel. For more breaking news and updates, you can check out our website eacnews.asia or search EAC News on Telegram or at your favorite app store. More from the EAC News team tomorrow night at 8 p.m. We will see you then.